Today is the day that I get to present all of my research that I've done at Jefferson Lab, and we're doing it at ODU. So I'm actually in my little, in the little uh, Society of Physics Students Lounge, doing some last-minute preparation, and then I'm gonna pass the camera on to my mom so that she can record the presentation. One thing I'm doing is I'm gonna record all of the RU students' presentations. That way they can go home and show their family stuff like that, since a lot of them are from different states like Louisiana, so that'll be good for them. I'm probably just going to run through this presentation one more time by myself, make sure I'm fluid with it. Wish me luck. Next speaker up is Andrew Dodson, who will be talking about minimizing kick and slope in intermediate bunches for electron cooling. That's right. Uh, these are a bunch of <laughs> right. Thank you. These are a bunch of words that I need to define for you all. So um, today I'm going to talk about kicker cavities, electron cooling, optimization, minimization, and how all of this applies to the Jefferson Lab electron ion collider that we will get, <laughs> no matter how bad or how well, uh, they can take it from us. So, a few things about the electron ion collider is that we want to accelerate electrons and positively charge nuclei towards each other. We want to do this so that we can kind of probe the interactions between the quarks and the gluons inside of the nuclei. Now, the way we look at things normally is by photons scattering off of an object. Some of that scattered light makes it into our retina and our brain develops an image of it. This works on a similar, on a similar scale except for instead of photons we're using electrons because we want to look at things smaller. Um, now the ions that we want to use to collide with the electrons are created from this very hot plasma and that makes it difficult to create a dense beam out of it. So there's a process called electron cooling where you direct a beam of bunched electrons with the same relative velocity over the ions and those bunched electrons help absorb some of that transverse energy away from the ions. Transverse energy is the same thing as heat for all intents and purposes. The more electrons you have flying over it, the faster and the more heat you take away from those ion bunches. So in an ideal world, you could just jump up the current of that electron gun that supplies the electron bunches and have it done in a jiffy. That's just not really attainable. So a way around this is by reusing some of those electrons in the cooling ring. If we let the, uh, the cooling ring run for 11 cycles, we can trick the ion beam into thinking we have enough current to make the ion beam sufficiently small. Now the way that uh, the electron cooling makes the beam more dense is kind of portrayed here. This can be the ion beam, and as you get rid of some of that transverse energy, the particles become more and more compact. That's because they're not whizzing around anymore. They're more or less in the same location. So if we want to cycle the cooler ring 11 times before kicking electron bunches, now we need a way of kicking them out. And the way to do that is through RF kicker cavities, which supply a very strong pulsed electric field at regular intervals. Anytime you see reference to pulses or intervals or something that's periodic, that's screaming sines and cosines. So what I want to do here is I want to provide a kick to every 11th bunch. For clarity, I want to make it a unit kick. And I also want to reduce the slope and kick at all of the bunches that aren't the 11th. Uh, why the slope is important? Well, if you're kicking the intermediate bunches, they're going to do a little bit of this. Adding slope to the term gives a little bit of a seesaw action going on. We don't want that either. There's no physical reason to suspect that both the kick and the slope should be weighted equally. So another goal of this project is to create a Pareto front that can compare how much the kick and the slope terms really affect the solution. Now, how do we leave the intermediate bunches alone? You need to do a little bit of math. Uh, so, like I said, these pulsed uh, signals can be described as a linear combination of sines and cosines. We're going to use cosines. Um, the location of each electron bunch is going to be J. Uh, we're going to be kicking every nth bunch and i is the index that we're summing over for bookkeeping. I mentioned minimizing the slope as well, so that says that we're going to take the derivative of this function with respect to theta in order to get a term that relates to the slope. Now, 
Because of the symmetry of sine and cosine functions, we don't want terms canceling each other out in the minimization routine. So in order to get rid of that possibility, squaring both terms makes everything positive before summing all of the intermediate uh, kicks and slips. If we define, if we choose an x0 such that it's equal to 1 minus the sum of the other solution coefficients, we can normalize our function at theta equals 0. Doing some trigonometry, we arrive at the function that I want to minimize, this guy right here. Uh, what's interesting about this is we're summing over i, we're summing over j. That means that this whole function only depends on the x sub i's. That's the quantity that I'm going to be optimizing such that the entire thing is minimized. Now there's already a pre-existing solution that says if we use all terms of that series, we can get zero kick and zero slope at every single intermediate bunch. And that's great, but using the five cell kicker cavities that we have at Jefferson Lab, those can provide either the odd terms or the even terms, but not both. Uh, one kicker can provide one, three, five, seven, nine. Adding a second kicker and doubling the frequency can get you two, six, and 10. And then adding two more of those kickers can get you the rest. So all in all, it requires four kicker cavities to get the perfect solution. That costs on the order of about half a million dollars to use all of those pieces of copper kickers. Um, so how close can we get to that zero solution if we use two or one kicker? Well, since I'm not trying to get a perfect zero solution, it's not as easy as setting the derivative equal to zero and solving for x. Uh, this requires a little bit of numerical optimization, which is what my project had a lot to do with. Um, this whole optimization project was done in Python, and this has just been such a great tool when it comes to wanting to plot any kind of data, do optimization, or any kind of op uh, computational physics you can think of. This is just well equipped to handle all sorts of problems. Um, so I'm really thankful to have been able to learn this in the process. Uh, I said that using one kicker, you can supply the first, third, fifth, seventh, and ninth harmonics. That requires just one kicker. That's awesome. So if I take that as uh, the terms that I want to optimize, how close to zero can I get with that? And just to cover all my bases, let's do the second kicker solution as well. So I'm going to optimize all of these terms and then all of these terms and see if I can get pretty close to that perfect solution. I've said a lot about summing harmonics and intermediate bunches. And what that kind of means, what's important to take away from that is that if you're adding together terms of a series and you're looking at theta equal to zero, the slope immediately following the peak is greater than the sum of the two slopes. It's not somewhere in the middle. That helps you get kind of a delta function behavior of, uh, of your waveform. And that's what we want. We want a sharp pulse, nothing, and then another sharp pulse. Another thing to take away from this is that for any time you're adding together odd terms of a cosine series, you're going to get a valley right smack in the middle, right? Because for, for using one term, you get one turning point. Um, and that's what you get when you end up optimizing 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. You get a very pronounced kick right in the middle. But I said I don't want any kick at all the intermediate bunches. I want those to be as close to zero as possible. And there's a huge valley right there. The cool thing about this, though, is that I have a bunch here, and I have a bunch here but not here. So it just misses it. There's no kick in between that fifth and sixth bunch, which I think is, is a, a kind of amazing. Um, so, like I said earlier, there's no reason to suspect that the kick and the slope terms should be weighted equally. Uh, a way to check how much you should weight one versus the other is by using a Pareto front. Now, say you had a product that you wanted to buy, right? And you had the cost of the product and the quality of the product. Now, if you want the cost to go down, you want it cheaper, you're not going to get a very good quality product. So using a Pareto front can let you say, can let you optimize saying, what's the best I can get for my money and not want to bash my head against the wall just using hand-waving arguments. So if we say we want to have some weighting factor lambda, and we attach this to our kicking function. Lambda equal to zero says that we're only going to be minimizing the kick. Lambda equal to one means that we're only going to be minimizing the slope. 
Um, these are going to be the two objectives. This is the analog to the price versus quality. We're going to be facing off kick and slope against each other and seeing which one is more important. So after graphing the Pareto front, we can have our sum of the slope squared versus the sum of the kick squared. Now I said that at lambda equal to zero, we're only going to be minimizing the kick. <coughs> that means that the slope is free to be any, arbitra any arbitrarily large value that it wants to be. So at lambda equal to zero, the kick is minimized, but we get slopes gradually going up and up as we use fewer and fewer kickers. And then the inverse is true if we focus on only minimizing the slope. <coughs> now, this makes, the Pareto front makes it abundantly clear that the use of just one kicker uh, has a factor of three times more sum of squared slopes than using two kickers. We have about 30 here, about 10 here. And the fact is, is no matter how far along you trace that graph, that difference between the two is still about a factor of a third difference. So that means that you can weight the slope as much or as little as you want, and you're still going to get a much better result if you use a second kicker. Um, adding a third kicker gives you a better result. Adding uh, a fourth kicker gets you the perfect result. Zero kick, zero slope at all intermediate punches. So in conclusion, using this Pareto front lets us see uh, just exactly how much better using one kicker versus two versus three will get us closer to the uh, zero kick, zero slope at intermediate punches. It provides a visual representation of saying, wow, we do this much better at introducing a second kicker. Let's invest in it. It's worth investing in. <coughs> Adding a second kicker did reduce the sum of the slope squared by a factor of three, but there still needs to be a little bit of studying done to see if it's still worth the extra $100,000 to use the second kicker. Um, and I think that about sums it up. I'd like to thank my mentors, uh, Dr. Terzik and Dr. Hutton, for being very patient with me and welcoming all the questions that I had, and as well as Dr. Sadagata for being there when I felt I asked those two too many questions. <laughs> Thanks. So thank you. Questions or comments for Todd? Yeah. Can you explain again why you can use like linear optimization techniques, like uh, a great ball or something? The sequential least squares? Well, yeah, so, so this is, set, uh, is sort of the Lagrange multiplier version of um, optimization for, for the numerical analog to Lagrange multipliers. So this will attach a scaling factor such that when you take the derivative of the function, it'll point to the direction where the function is either increasing or decreasing. The fact that the waveform, uh, I think it might have been this way actually. The fact that the waveform is just a uh, combination of sines and cosines led me to believe that this function is going to be well behaved. So some sort of genetic algorithm or something along those lines wasn't necessary. It was a bit overkill. I also cross-referenced cross those results using Nelder Mead uh, optimization, which is a simplex algorithm, to see that I got the same results. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Go on. Yeah. on the third to last slide, uh, where you have the graphs of the various kickers, like one, yes, this one right here. Yes. Uh, I see that you have uh, two, three kickers graphed, and there's a huge difference between right. three. Oh, what, where's that difference? Okay, so that goes to show, so let's go back to defining how many kickers it takes to get the perfect solution. So uh, using one kicker, you get 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. 2 will get you 2, 6, and 10, along with 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And then adding a third can get you either the fourth or the eighth, uh, but not both of those. So in order to get both of those solutions, you need to incorporate the four kickers. Um, using two tabs for three kickers lets you say what happens if I use the fourth and what happens if I choose the eighth as my third kicker. And using the fourth, harmonic gets you a much better solution. So if you are strongly advocating for using three kickers, make sure you use the fourth harmonic and not the eighth. But it still remains to be seen if, if it's worth the investment. Yes? Um, kind of
There's a sensitivity to the lower harmonics and the kicker cavities, um, which I am unfamiliar with. So I'm going to wave my hands and say, you know, don't shoot the theorist. I, I can't explain why the lower is, but it is. Thanks, guys. All right. So that's quite a jump, jumping from week as a physics intern episode zero to me finishing my research. There's plenty to do with the remaining two weeks. I'm just so happy I got to present in front of everybody. I love being able to explain things to people. Not to mention, uh, everyone who presented did such a great job. And I want to see if it's okay if I can post the videos I took of them um, onto the channel as well. That way there's not just too much of me or anything biased towards uh, theoretical physics too much. Granted, there, was pe there were people that did their project on theoretical quantum chromodynamics, and they killed it. They made something as abstract and hard to follow as the cutting edge theory of physics interesting and approachable. So far as you're comfortable with a little bit of calculus, Taylor expansions, blah, 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 but that's details. Um, in the remaining two weeks, I need to get my poster presentation set up and ready, which is going to be more detail-oriented. Uh, so I'll be working on that and also adding some final touches to my code to make it spit out something that's more qualitative. Um, but yeah, everything's winding down now. Or winding up, because this presentation coming up is the one that matters. Next video will probably be preparation for that poster session that I have to do as well as writing my paper, finishing my code, and tying up all the loose ends of the internship. All right.